The Transmitter. Here we are. Welcome to Synaptic. This is our podcast that investigates the people, the research, and the challenges of the neuroscience field. This is episode 11 of Synaptic. My name is Brady Huggett. I host the show, and we're glad to have you listening. Thanks for joining. Now, for today's show, let's start in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas, around 2004, somewhere in that timetable. And let's go to Tarrant County College, specifically the South Campus, which is located in South Fort Worth. Tarrant is a community college. It was established in 1965 and has a mission statement providing affordable and open access to quality teaching and learning. Tarrant has five physical campuses in Tarrant County. And in 2023, it had a total undergraduate enrollment of nearly 45,000 students, with the average age for students being 23. 58% of the enrollment is female. And in 2004, one of those females was Lauren O'Connell. That's today's guest, Lauren O'Connell. She was at Tarrant to get some education, maybe to work toward a nursing degree. But while she was there, a teacher named Jean Deschweinitz pulled her aside and said, I think you should raise your sights a little bit. I think you should consider transferring. Now, not long after that, Lauren received, in the mail, unsolicited, a flyer inviting her to transfer to Cornell University, way up there in Ithaca, New York. She has no idea how the school found her, but she applied and was accepted into the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Now, Cornell does this with some regularity, I should say. Currently, 30% of the undergraduates in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences are transfers. Cornell accepted Lauren, and she went off to a top-tier university in the Northeast. That flyer in the mail changed my life, as she says in this podcast. We talked about that, how it set her on a new path. We talked about how this new path was difficult for her parents to understand. And we talked about her winning Harvard's Bauer Fellowship and what it did for her career. And of course, we talked about animal behavior and Lauren's work in frog pair bonding. All of that in the next hour. I interviewed Lauren on February 9th, 2024, in her office in the Gilbert Biology Science Building on Stanford's campus. It was a very nice day in Palo Alto bright sun, around 60 degrees. The building next to us was under construction, so sometimes in the recording you can hear the sound of work being done. Her office has whiteboards and bare walls and a row of windows, so the audio is a little bouncy, as I like to say. And there is an occasional pinging from what I think are heating pipes, but maybe that will help you feel like you were in the room with us. I had not interviewed a frog researcher before, and I really enjoyed Lauren. So let's pick the interview up here, where we're chatting about commute times and how long she's been at Stanford. That should be enough to get us going. Here is your synaptic episode with Lauren O'Connell starting right now. You know, go hiking or something like that. My spouse works in Redwood City, so he has to... He has a commute, like he a 20-minute commute, yeah. yeah. So the first thing would be, like, how long have you been at Stanford? Uh, I've been here for around hmm, seven years, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I came here when I started, like, my assistant professor job. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's been seven years in Palo Alto. And where did you live before this? Uh, before this, I lived in Boston. Yeah. Because I had a fellowship position. At the ba- Harvard. The Bauer Fellowship. Yeah. All right, let's go, let's even go back to the beginning. You are not from Boston originally. No. Right. Where, where are you from? I'm from Texas. What part? Um, it's like close to the DFW area. Um, I, don't, I don't know what DFW is. Oh, it's, that's Dallas-Fort Worth. Oh, okay. I do know what that is, <laughs> right. Yeah. I actually don't live, didn't live in an incorporated town because I grew up on a farm. Uh-huh. And so... Um, it's with this place called Rendon, which is like not even a town. Um, but yeah, so I grew up on this farm kind of in the, in that general vicinity. 
around DFW. Yeah. Okay. So like a dairy farm? We... Uh, no, we had goats. So we did do, they were dairy goats. So we did, and but we had like chickens and llamas and, and uh-huh. things like that. And it was like a working farm. Yeah. So that was the source of income for the family. Uh, my, we had this goat farm and then my parents are also artists. Really? Yeah. What kind? Uh, well, they, my dad is trained in ceramics and so he did a lot of ceramics and part of our barn was a, had like a, a like a wheel yeah. and everything. Uh-huh. Yeah. And he does raku pottery. And then, um, and then my mom does, uh, she's a great illustrator. And so they had this, uh, graphic design company that they ran out of this shed Wow, <laughs> on our farm. <laughs> okay, so uh, so then my question is, how the farm, was this like a family lineage thing? H- how is it that your family was in Texas at all? I guess maybe that's the question. Ah, uh, yeah, no, my parents are like from Texas. Mm. And so they, um, you know, there's this kind of cultural thing in Texas to like not be dependent on the government and yeah. to kind of live off the grid. And that's where I think that came from, that desire to have a farm and be self-sufficient. Aha, uh-huh. so they started the farm. Yes. Okay, and then they started, that would make sense for the ceramics. They're gonna make their own pots, they're gonna make yeah. their own whatever. The illustration doesn't fit quite into that, Me, that was one yeah. of the business. Well, they needed money. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so they started this uh, farm to provide, so th- I guess were they selling the goat milk as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we made goat milk and uh, goat chocolate, and then oh also like, uh, you know, some goat is like a, dish meat. you know yeah. like a meat yeah. um in some cases and so that we were sold them for those too um and then we had llamas and we like um spun llama wool and things like that and you say we so i'm assuming part of your growing up is spinning llama wool yeah milking goats yes yeah. <laughs> me and my siblings <laughs> how, many, how many kids in the family? i uh th- yeah i'm one of four i'm the oldest okay so your parents start this farm yeah your dad teaches himself ceramics or yeah yeah he well he actually he was a marine um and and he's a vietnam war veteran uh-huh. and so when he got out of the war he um uh he went to school for pottery um and he didn't end up finishing that school um he didn't end up graduating from college because he it was a lot of money and so he started then working construction mm-hmm. and then he met my mom and they decided to um kind of be, they wanted a, a place where they can kind of live off of the land and yeah. be independent from yeah. the government. And yeah. then they decided to do that once they started a family. Independent from the government, meaning um, I'm not paying my taxes or just like, yeah. we don't, oh, really? Sh- yes. <laughs> that kind of vibe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions and just tell me where I'm wrong, right? So your father returns from the war. Yeah probably a little disenfranchised yeah yeah a little bit i think it was like a mix of like i I think texas has a culture of being anti-government anyways and then he also they were very religious and so i think christian yeah Yeah. they were seventh day adventist and so which is a special branch flavor yeah (laughs) um and that like really believes in like the end of times and things like that and kind of like being self-sufficient to prepare for something like that Okay, now this is becoming clear to me. I'm, I'm actually a little struck by your father returning from the war and saying I'm going to go into ceramics. I don't think I would have guessed that would be the choice. Do you know why he did that? Um, no. Well, I think he really liked that in high school. I don't think he had a lot of options. You know, but if you're kind of growing up in the middle of nowhere, I don't think you have a lot of options if uh-huh. you don't have a lot of money. Yeah. And so um, that going into the military kind of seemed uh, like to make sense um and i actually think that you know going into ceramics i think is after something like being in a war can be kind of healing in in a way um because you know you're working he likes to work with his hands you know because he was a carpenter for a little bit and so i think like making something very pretty um is kind of heals your soul in a way yeah yeah so that makes sense and he met your mother and she was already an illustrator. Yeah, she had been working as an illustrator for since she was very young. And they said, let's go off by ourselves, 
buy a plot of land or did yeah. they already have the okay. No, they bought a plot of land. Bought a plot of land yeah. and we're going to become Started self-sufficient yeah. and kind of prepare for end times. Yes. Okay. And then into <laughs> this mix, you are born. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about growing up. Uh, growing up. Yeah. I, so I, they had us go to a religious school uh-huh. in the beginning, um, the seventh day Adventist school. So it was like very kind of in a, in a religious bubble almost. And then like this anti-government religious bubble. Um, and, uh, and then I had a lot of farm chores. So. Llamas, the goats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you have a lot of kids because you have a lot of, uh, there's chores. a lot of jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is like, this is why you had kids in the first place in the olden days is to handle the farm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, there was a lot of that. You're growing up. At, at some point, do you become interested in science? Was there an expectation that you help run the farm one day, that you were going to join the church? I don't know. Um, yeah, so I think they expected me to do something useful. And then, so for me, something useful that like a girl could do was to be in like the veterinary field. Um, so working with animals or like being a nurse in some way. Mm. Um, and so, and I liked those things. I, I liked, um, you know, I didn't realize it, but like working on this farm and like dealing with a lot of agriculture, I think that it actually introduced me in a way that I didn't realize until much later to like animal genetics and animal behavior. Yeah. Um, and so I think I that kind of primed me to be interested in those realms of science. Um, and so because I thought I like needed to be something useful to my community, like a nurse or some type of veterinary aid, um, then I like tried to be like good at science in school oh okay yeah because you're thinking maybe if i go to vet school i'm going to need the science yeah like that yeah exactly and so was your plan to go to vet school yeah um no i my plan was to do some type of nursing because i wanted to help people and so i went to i was going to be this i went to community college Uh um you know because my dad didn't finish college and my mom did eventually finish college like after kids and stuff like that Um, And my dad actually eventually, I think when I was in graduate school, finished community college. Mm. And so there was some like recognition that you need something a little bit more past high school. And so anyway, I went to community college and then I really liked science at that point. And my professors actually really tried to talk me into transferring to a university to get like a four year degree. Um, so which, this is, uh, I do know this, this is Tarrant County College. Tarrant something. County College. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you're sort of in the nursing track or something. Yeah. And taking biology, biology classes. Biology classes, right. yeah. And some professor says, you might want to aim higher than this. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Her name, her name is Jean Deschweinitz, actually. She, she's, an, she's an amazing human. And yeah. every time I'm back in that area, I try to, <laughs> try to chat with her because she was just so amazing. And she was my biology professor. And she like, got me a job in a lab and like, tried to convince me that I needed to transfer. Um, which my family didn't think was like an incredibly useful thing to do to like go to go to college and then especially moving away from home and then you know by the time I went to graduate school they thought I yeah I was like that they thought that was a total waste of time Uh so Uh, so I'm interested what what do you think this professor saw I mean so let me I I should back this up yeah did they just pulled you aside one day and said listen Lauren you're doing great in this class, and I'd like you to think about maybe expanding your worldview or going to a better school yeah. because oh, while Tarrant is plenty good, I want yeah. more for you. Yeah, yeah. They like nominated me for like a summer. It was this. Um, they nominated me for this program, this uh, LSAMP program. It's for um, like to get people who are underrepresented, like either racially or ethnically or socioeconomically, geography, geography, rural people from rural places, like into science. And they nominated me through that program. And so I went to uh, University of Texas Arlington, which was the closest. So it, it was like an hour away, but it was the closest university I had to my hometown. Um, and, and so I went there in the summer to like, do a summer internship Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think that really helped me then like transfer from community college so then you began to look around where can I transfer from yeah exactly and I I I was gonna stay in Texas because I just like my world was very small at that point and I got this flyer in the mail from Cornell who I had never heard of before Mm. I was like I don't know what Cornell is um, but I'm gonna apply anyways 
and uh, and then I got in. <laughs> That's the only place you applied. I applied to Cornell. I applied to Texas Christian University, TCU, because yeah. that's like eventually where my mom graduated from. And then I applied to UT, University of Texas, Austin. So these three places. And I had never heard of Cornell before. And How did they find you? I have no you? idea. They're actually, Cornell is really amazing actually at getting transfer students um, in into the university. They, uh, they, they take a lot of transfer students. Like they, they focus on it somehow. Yeah, yeah. They have a lot of support mechanisms and things like that. I have no idea how they got my name, but Thank that God. like flyer in the yeah. mail changed my life. <laughs> um, I want to go back to this teacher thing, because I'm. but what do you think it was that they saw? So for some reason they said, well, this person, let's see if we can help them. Yeah. What, what do you think it was? I don't know. I, 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 it was a long time ago. I think, I mean, I think I was like good at the class and they like saw that I was like getting the material and quickly. And I, you know, I, I actually hung out, like I went to their office hours and now I realize how rare that that is (laughs) that like students like come to talk to you (laughs) in your office hours. Um, and so, you know, to like talk through problems and things like that and like about like my life and, you know, growing up on this farm and I think they could tell I was a little like in this like agricultural religious bubble Mm. and that this like could be a way out of that that sounds so I if if I had to guess it would be that it would be that you were coming to the office and saying you know can you tell me more about what we talked about in class today yeah and also sharing your life and they thought this is an eager person with a you know, like a curious mind. Let's yeah. see if we can nurture them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. And then this flyer comes in the mail somehow. I'm still fascinated. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, to this day, I do not know how they got my like address in the middle of rural Texas to send so this to me. So you send off to Cornell, and you get in. Yeah, I, I I got in. And so now, do you have to go to your family and say, not only am I transferring to a different school, but I'm going to leave the state? The, yeah, because the... we had I had never been like that far north, and so. Where had you been? Had you been out of Texas? I had been out of Texas, like, because we have family in Oklahoma uh-huh. and, and family in Louisiana. Um, and so I had been in, like, sur- some surrounding states, but I had never been, like, north of Tennessee or, you know, north, you know, that far north. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So they were not happy about that, but they were like, well, you know, this is something you want to do. And, and I was very homesick and very, it was like a big culture shock for me. Um, going there um, but you okay. know they drove me up there oh, and they, they dropped me off and then they just, they were like okay and they like put all my stuff on the side of the road and then they were like I'll see you later and then they drove turn around Seriously? and drove back down yeah Are you, I mean, did they take you into your dorm no no because <laughs> no, then no they were just like all right we got to go and then, um, yeah, because they had like, you know, the, there's like a farm waiting for them and stuff yeah, like they had that. A long we have drive. a huge responsibility, exactly. Yeah. And we couldn't like afford a flight yeah. to like there. Um, and so, yeah, so they just shot me off. And uh, yeah, only later did I realize when I saw these families helping people into their dorms that, like, uh, oh, that's that, what college looks like. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that I was missing something here. <laughs> Um, but they didn't know. They like no. didn't live at a, like live in a dorm in a university or something like that. They had no way of knowing that's what you do. I mean, they could have put you on a bus. They drove you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They rented a, a, van, a van, drove me up. So tell me about this culture shock. So did you have a roommate? I had a roommate. You know, you'd never met this person before, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was that person's background? Oh, she's a, yeah. She was a she's a New Yorker. Um, lots of people from Cornell are yeah. from New York. Uh, she, so yeah, uh, she was amazing. She, um, yeah, we definitely had like different paces of life and different backgrounds, um, but we ended up being becoming really great friends. Um, then I still talk, like I still talk with her. She's from Pleasant, so she's from. I don't know if she's from this. She's from Pleasantville, New York. Uh, okay. And, uh, and not so, like Long Island. Not or, Long Island. Yeah, okay. yeah, but she's from like New York State, and so. Still a world away from where yeah. I was. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was like very rough for me. Like I had a very thick Texan accent, you know, I have had a very regional accent. People thought I was stupid and, you know, and just, <laughs> and so it was, it was tough like fitting in and I like, 
I think just as transfer students have, it's, it's tough anyways. Cause we were like, I was like told to my face that like we didn't belong there or people, they, people didn't think transfer students should be allowed to come to Cornell. By who? Like other By students? By another students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like you didn't deserve it academically to be in there? Yeah. Because we you were just like transferred. like charity here. cases. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. or they like, we weren't prepared for college or something like that, you know, cause you know, I paid maybe like $300 like, cause I was a waitress paying my way into this like community college, yeah. which was worked out fine. Um, and so, but then I like transferred to Cornell. And so I like, I met these amazing professors who like really care about teaching. It was like only $300 like a year that I could easily make like waiting tables. And then to like transfer to a place where I had to like take out a bunch of student loans and things like that. I think like also I was like getting this like the same degree, but like taking a shortcut and I think that was like their perception. But you, so you had to take out loans for Cornell. Oh yeah. Yeah, right. So you weren't accepted with any like financial aid or anything like that. I did have some financial yeah. aid. Yeah. But yeah. still, loans are going to be needed. Yeah. On top of that. Yeah. And you transferred in as a sophomore or a junior. A, tra- a, a junior. A junior. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I got financial aid to like cover all my tuition, but I had to cost of living. Co- yeah, yeah, exactly. Like room and board. Were you prepared for classes? Um, I think I was, re- I, I think so. I think I was really just overwhelmed by the differences in the classes um, and how that was everybody's just full-time job because at a community college, you are typically, tip- students typically have full-time jobs yeah. or like families are taken care of and like everybody just like studied all the time. And I think that was like the expectation. Um, and so I think I, I struggled with like the pace of the courses and then just that being like the expectation that you have this, that you're just studying all the time. Um, and so, so yeah, I didn't, and then, you know, like having, I really missed home at that point. Yeah. Like I, I remember being like dropped off at campus and I was like, okay, like, how do I eat? <laughs> like, where is the food? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just like worrying about these like kind of basic needs. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. And then like having enough money to like buy food and things yeah. like that. Cause I also needed to find a job. Yeah. Um, and, and no car. I mean, I, so exactly. Like no you car. get the food? How yeah. I don't know. And so I like, yeah. didn't even know how a dining hall worked or something like that. So it was like a big, like learning curve. And I think I didn't do well my first semester there but then I like you know it took me a minute to figure out how things worked and then I ended up doing really well uh two two things I want to ask about one is did you lose your accent very quickly if people are making fun of you and saying yeah you you sound stupid you probably your accent cleaned up quick yes yeah yeah Yeah. it's yeah it still comes back when I'm talking to my mom or (laughs) or when you're home or when I'm home when I'm like have a glass of wine but um but yeah I worked really hard to try to to, to soften it a little bit because yeah to fit in yeah exactly um, and then the second thing is when when you transferred you're also thinking biology yeah okay so tell me what you studied in your remaining two years yeah well I I wanted to do like biochemistry and I wanted to um to prop to be um, at that point I was like oh maybe I can be a doctor instead of a nurse like that had never occurred to me before like uh-huh. no one had ever said that. And so, um, because girls aren't doctors, girls aren't doctors uh-huh. where, I, where I'm from. Yeah. So now you're in a place where girls can be doctors. Girls can they, be doctors. Yeah. yeah. Which was well, but also I had no idea like what being a scientist was. I had no idea that was a job. And so I'm at a big, and now I'm at a big university and like there, I got a job working in a lab, like doing media prep for like, for yeast cultures. Yeah. And, uh, and then I'm like, oh, like these like being a scientist is a job <laughs> and which is something that never even occurred to me did you get that job because you needed a job or because you were interested in science um be, well uh, both so both. i needed a job and so um because part of my financial aid required me to get a have a job and to do community service um and so so yeah i needed a job yeah. to keep my to keep my financial aid yeah. <laughs> and so yeah i got a job doing like lab prep stuff um, and, uh, yeah, but then I, like, I, I thought I wanted to do biochemistry and then I looked at these classes that they had here and I saw a bunch of classes on like animal behavior. Mm. And then when I started taking these classes, I was like, Oh, this stuff about the brain is really cool. 
and I started like ta- and I switched my concentration to this neurobiology of behavior track that they have mm. at Cornell Biological Sciences, and then I and then I got introduced to people like doing science in nature, and then I was like, oh, this is where I want to be. And I couldn't actually do any of that at the time because a lot of field experiences are unpaid and I I don't come from money. (laughs) Like my parents weren't like paying for me to be at college. And so I like couldn't accept any positions that didn't pay. And so I didn't get to do any field work when I was there, but I, I recognized that it was a thing and it was a job people had. And I decided kind of that's what I wanted to do, like mm. study the brain in nature. And and then I wanted to go to graduate school to do that. Okay, so but you want to study the brain in nature and animals. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think growing up on a farm, I really, I liked animals. I thought, you know, I understood, you know, the animals that we had. Um, and then I also did this like summer shadowing thing to, at a where I shadowed a physician, and I did not like it mm. at all. I think like I I shadowed somebody in an MS clinic, and they were kind of testing this person that came in, and they went through this like flow chart, this like yes no flow chart, and then they basically at the end of this thing told this person, this like eighteen year old woman that she had MS and she's like she was crying and her family was crying and I just felt like I should not be in that room that it was like a very like personal Mm. moment and I was and I thought that I was like wow I think you know I want to work on the basic aspects of these things um rather than like working on the human aspects and doing like diagnoses and things like that I want to figure out actually how to fix the problem um, as know. opposed to being the one who might say you have this problem. Yes. Yeah. 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 And the, the yes, no is kind of, kind of like if, you know, do you have this? Yes. Okay. Then I'll follow up with this question. Does this happen? Yes. Oh, shoot. Oh, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I didn't like that flow chart. Yeah. Um, I thought it was like very, you know, it was very binary. Impersonal. And, and, and impersonal. And I didn't like that at all. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask this too. So growing up, Seventh Day Adventist, were you... You know, if you start thinking about biology and animals and evolution, that's usually outside of the church's thinking. So was yeah. that something you needed to overcome? Um, yeah, so I didn't learn about evolution until I got to Cornell. I had never taken a class. This yeah. is not taught in public school yeah. in Texas um, back then. I don't know if it is now. But, um, yeah, I, oh, I didn't learn about evolution. Like, the e, the e word it was a bad word. Really? <laughs> yeah. So in school you're learning the arc uh i well definitely like when i was in like elementary school noah's arc that's how animals yeah 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 and then i like and then at some point in middle school we um you know we had a lot my you know we had there were four of us at this point and my parents couldn't afford uh this private school anymore and so they put us into public school and so we weren't learning like biblical passages at that point but we also like you know even in public school they're not learning about evolution in, the, in that same way. Like the evolution is kind of this, you know, bad word. But how, but how are they explaining a- animals? Just that they're out there. They're yeah. not saying, they're not tying it to God or anything. No. They're just saying animals are out there. Yeah. We're not going to discuss evolution. Yeah. Like yeah. you just talk about like a, like a physiological process, yeah. like, you know, the, like how hearts work and things yeah. like that. And I think you don't even have to touch upon how it got to be that way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now you're at Cornell and you come across evolution. Oh, I took an evolutionary biology class and I was like, oh my God, everything makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, it it was like, yeah, I loved that class just because I was like, everything makes sense. (laughs) For the first time in my life. For the first time, yeah, exactly. So did that, (laughs) is that the thing that, never mind that you spent the time shadowing this physician and you didn't like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Was this the thing that said, no, I want to, because a lot of what you do is now evolutionary biology, kind yeah. of, yeah? Yeah, but yeah. This is the thing that did it. Yeah, yeah. I think like a mix of like finding really interesting classes on the brain and behavior and like coming from like a childhood of being outside all the time working with animals yeah. on a farm and then like taking this evolution class and being like, Everything makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to put that together. 
in some way. Um, did you bring up that class with your family, your parents, and say, I took this amazing class today. There's this thing called evolution. Um, uh, I brought I it up with my siblings. Mm. Yeah. You and being the so, oldest. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, none of my siblings are religious. Um, and I'm pretty sure my parents think that that's my fault. <laughs> You know, if you'd they, never gone to Cornell. Yeah, exactly. They sent me away to this like liberal, you know, place in New York. And I think that they, you know, they, maybe not now, but they definitely thought that that might have been a mistake. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So you finish two years later, you finish with your degree. Yeah. And then you already know, you look, I actually want to be a researcher. Yeah. So you started looking for a PhD program? Yeah, yeah. So, um, because I was like, I was in a lab um, and they helped me apply for graduate school and things like that because I had no idea. Yeah. How to do that even. How to do that or what to do or like how to pick graduate programs or things like that. And so my my lab, um, yeah, when I was at Cornell really helped me with that. And so I ended up applying to a bunch of places, but I ended up going back to... UT Austin to Texas because I really, you know, I, I did miss being um, home. And then the other thing was my sister was having a, uh, a baby and she was kind of on her own with that. And I wanted to be there to help her. Um, so to be, be like close to, to, to to have some family responsibilities. So I went back to Texas. If you're thinking like the next five, six years of my life or whatever, might as well be close to you're you're going to be about to be an aunt. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you move back to Texas and you Mm -hmm. go to UT Austin. Yeah. Yeah. Your PhD was behavioral. Yeah. It was, well, I think it was like, I think it's like technically cell molecular biology. Oh yeah. That's right. But I did, um, I I, I was in, I I picked labs that studied some aspect of neuroscience and some animal that you could also study in the wild. Um, And, you know, there are lots of people studying like mice in the wild now, but I either you know it wasn't happening as much back then or you know I wasn't aware of it and so the only people who were really like accepting students like that were were these people who were working in these like ectothermic animals like lizards and and frogs and and things like that or fish um and so and so I decided to do something like that because I all I always had like fish or like a snake or a tarantula or whatever when I was growing up um and uh so that didn't creep me out at all and I was totally and I knew that they had like very complex behaviors that we didn't quite understand yet, but it was a little bit more simple, you know, than working in a, in a mammal. Yeah. So you do that for, I don't know, five years? Yeah. Graduate with your PhD. Yeah. And then you get this Bauer Fellowship. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, well, cause one of the reasons, so I thought, uh, so I wanted to be a scientific illustrator uh. actually at that time and so I was like I either want to like go into graduate school but I don't know how to do that but I do know how to do like illustration because this is what my family did and so I was like I think I could be like in between these worlds and be a scientific illustrator and so I was like I think I'm going to apply but those jobs are hard to get and so I was like I think I'm going to apply to these PhD programs to be able to be like better prepared for being a scientific illustrator. Um, and so, so I got into this PhD program and this was still my plan at the yeah. end. Like I did, I, I had no intention or even the thought that it, I could be a faculty member. Um, yeah. Cause I, ha- I still, I think, you know, I had this really amazing woman professor at a community college, you know, and where she, where you do a lot of teaching. And so I really didn't have any like women PIs that like ran research groups and stuff like that. And so for some reason, it just, maybe that's the reason, I'm not sure, it didn't even occur to me to like be a faculty member. And so I, so I had, you know, I was, I had gotten married and I was like pregnant with my, my first kid at the time. And I was becoming really interested in, in parental care and things like that. But I was still not going to go into academia and then I, and one of the reasons is because what I wanted to do, like no one did. There was like no place for me to do a postdoc or like, and no kind of opportunity to start something totally new. And so, so I was just going to go into doing this scientific illustration. And then what happened was that um, this person from Harvard, Andrew Murray, who runs the Bauer Fellows program, came to give a talk at UT Austin. Mm. 
and like asked me like if I could do anything what would I want to do and I told him the thing and I was like but there's like no place to do that for me to postdoc to do that oh you didn't say illustrator you said I'd like to study yeah I, I like I'd like to study this but this isn't possible so I'm gonna go do this illustration thing mm -hmm. over here yeah and he was like well you should apply to this thing this like program that I run that like it's for people starting new things and I was like okay and so I'm on maternity leave I like or you know I, I I'm like bouncing my baby with like one foot I wrote this fellowship application on this idea and then I sent it off and then I'm like about to start this job as, as an illustrator yeah and uh and then and it was the only thing I applied for other than like an, uh, an actual job and and then it, it came back and they accepted me into this place at Harvard do you ever think about that like um, are these, any of these drawings yours um, all of the drawings in the hallway are mine. Yours. So and you're a good illustrator, website. obviously, yeah. right? Yeah. So that I think that would have been a wonderful life for you had you done yeah. that. But yeah. it came very close to... Because yeah. if you hadn't applied, you were just... that was, You'd be doing the illustration yeah. jobs now. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you ever think about that? Oh, I think about stuff like that all the time. <laughs> like, if I hadn't met Andrew at this, like, one dinner, if I had been like, oh, I'm not going to go to this dinner. Yeah, I mean, I think about that here in the people I interact with now, like in this like position of power as a faculty member, like who I like open up my calendar to and like, you know, who I think like, it's just amazing how these like one little meetings can like change, change somebody's yeah. life, you yeah. know? And so, so yeah, this one dinner at this like barbecue place, <laughs> like opened up this door. And then I, so my, my spouse was like, well, um, we can't say no to this, yeah. this Harvard thing. This sounds nice. And so we moved, and my daughter was like one at the time. And so we moved to Boston. And I remember just being like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, <laughs> two things. Is your husband a scientist too? Did you uh, meet him yeah, at UT Austin? He, yeah, we met at UT Austin. He huh. is also a scientist. Okay. Um, he is in industry. Okay, so when he sees this Harvard thing, he's like, yeah, we can move the family. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, you move up there. Boston, too, like if you were unhappy-ish when you first landed in New York, like Boston is its own kind of cult, really, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. a, it's a different city. What yeah. did you make of it? Um, well, it's uh, very it's very cold. Yeah. I, I'm not a fan of being cold. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it... it it was, I think it's this like mix of like the, the weather and for me it was more like the lack of sunlight yeah. that I thought was really hard. Um, but also I think just like the culture was very different from like this southern uh, culture that I grew up in. Yeah. And so everybody's like just very direct and, uh, <laughs> and tells you what's on their mind, which I appreciate now. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I just, and then it's like this mix in of being at Harvard, you know, and everybody's like, oh, Harvard. And yeah. I'm like, ah, oh. like I, I, like I remember like walking through the Harvard quad and being like, like I don't belong in this place. <laughs> yes. And it, it was very difficult. But to, you did, to you do did that. belong in that place. <laughs> um, yeah. I like, you know, eventually, like years later, yeah. I like, I, did what I like set out to do there and like establish this like new system and neuroscience and things like that and I was like oh like I could actually stay here and be <laughs> and like you know be happy I guess um, so I felt much better about it at the end so you get this fellowship you want to set up to do this independent research that you considered but didn't really know how to do and someone said that's a good idea yeah but you didn't really know how to do it right like you had no. to you had to get animals you had to get frogs yeah. how did you how did yeah. you do all that yeah so I mean I picked frogs because they have this like I was interested in parental care because I was having my first child at yeah. the time yeah. and I you know frogs have these really wonderful like diversity and reproductive strategies that isn't really pop, like um, easily studied in any other vertebrate taxa and so I knew I wanted to study these frog behaviors, but you know, no one, you know, they've been a model system in ecology and evolution for a really long time, but no one was doing any neuroscience with them. No one was doing anything molecular with them. And so I was like, okay, this is what I'm gonna try to start. And, but when I got that fellowship, I was like, oh, now I have to figure out what I'm gonna do. Cause it, the, it was all just this like yeah. grandiose idea. And so what, who I reached out to was the really lovely people in the poison frog hobbyist community. 
And because there are people who raise these frogs and like have them in their basements and just like huh. really dedicate their like personal life to to growing these yeah. frogs and breeding them in captivity. And so I reached out to them and I was like, hi, I'm putting together an academic colony. You know, will you help me do this? And I started going to these hobbyist shows and talking to all of these people who eventually like helped me set up. This and they colony are, at Harvard. They're not in Boston, or are they? Uh, not? There, there are some like in Massachusetts, mm. um, and then you know they they are kind of sprinkled throughout uh, the U.S. And we still buy frogs from from hobbyists and and for our research and things okay. like that. And yeah. so you know they're like like they're not trained like trained in academic science, but that doesn't mean that they you know aren't like community scientists kind of in their own way you know they're very careful about observing the animals and they've been raising them for a long time and they are very much experts in this in this field and so i reached out to them and they helped me establish this colony um so that i could do the work do the work yeah. exactly yeah and so this so the the fellowship came two parts one is they're going to give you some funding to do this research yeah and two i think there's mentoring on how to set up and run a lab right is, yes. that, is that part of it oh definitely because this fellowship is for people right out of their phd yeah and yeah i mean i was 27 when i started this lab at harvard <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like i didn't know what i was doing and so like how to mentor other people like how to set up a lab how to run a budget like all of these things and so you have this mentoring committee um, actually, I of like four or five, like Harvard faculty that you meet, like kind of like a PhD committee. Um, they they meet with you and like help you through a lot of these um, these challenges. Like once a week or when, um, whenever we you met, meet them? like yeah, like twice a year. And then Andrew Murray, who's the director of this program and still runs a similar program, um, he we met like once a month and to like talk about all these things. So well, this is huge then. This is, I mean, now I understand, like when you leave there, not only have you done some research that's probably notable, but two, you could, you know how to run a lab. Yeah. 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 So the, your next job is that much easier. This, I mean, the it fellowship. Was, it was a lot easier. Yeah. I mean, I think we were protected a lot from all the administrative things that come with this job. And then also I, there was no, there was very little teaching. And so I think I, like coming here, I was still overwhelmed with the amount of like administrative things I had to do. Yeah. But I at least knew like how to do a budget, how to set up the colony, you know, of the animal colony, which was really important. I had like a clear sense of what we needed to do, um, which I think would have been impossible to do, like for a faculty member kind of starting a new system that would be like next to impossible. Yeah, yeah. So the, the fellowship is four years? It's five know, years. Five years, yeah. okay. And when that ends, you end up here at Stanford. Yeah. So yeah. how did you... And did you have your second child by then? Yeah, I had my second child when I was in, in Boston. Okay, so you yeah. have two, you and your husband, two children. Now you're looking for something new. And yeah. were you looking at Stanford? Was he looking to go to the West Coast? Or how yeah, did that happen? so he did a postdoc at Harvard Medical School. And so we, like, I went on the job market. Um, and, you know, because at that point I was decided I was going, you know, going to try, you know, I wanted to keep doing this research and I was going to be a faculty member. And so I got, you know, I applied to a bunch of places. I got some interviews, we got some offers. And then we basically, I sat down at the kitchen table one night. I was like, okay, these are the places that mm. will offer me a job. Where, where would you like to be? Like, where do you think you could also work and be happy? Um, and he picked Stanford mm. because, um, because the Bay Area just has a lot of opportunities for people in industry. So what, in, what is he in the biotech industry? Yeah. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, okay, and then you thought, well, we're gonna raise our family out in California. Yeah. I mean, what did your parents say to that? <laughs> I mean, they still think, uh, they think California, they, they feel the same way about California that they do about New York. New York, right. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, the, they, you know, it's like this liberal place where they're, you know, they watch, you know, they watch Fox News. So yeah. they think of like California as this place where like there's like rampant drugs and crime and things like, and they're like constantly worried about yeah. us. And I'm like, no. And the, grand, the grandkids. <laughs> the grandkids, right. exactly. I'm like, no, everything is everything fine. fine. <laughs> have, they, have they been to Stanford? Um, you know, no, they have, it's they gorgeous. have no, and they don't have any interest in, in coming over here. Well, they should, because they would not feel worried if they walked around the campus. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so seven years ago, roughly, you set you yeah. up your lab here. Um, there's a study that you did that I found, well, first off, I want to ask about wolf spiders. Okay. Because <laughs> when I'm reading your work, I understand how you can get trackers on fish or frogs, but I do not understand how you get them 
like when you are working with wolf spiders, are you tracking them in the wild? Um, we are not tracking them in the wild. We have a lot of them downstairs in our like lab colony. Yeah. And um, they do a very similar behavior to our frogs, actually. And so, you know, our frogs, uh, you know, they lay their eggs in the leaf litter. And then when the tadpoles hatch, they have to be transported to water somehow. And so the parents give them this like piggyback ride from the leaf yeah. to a pool of water. And, and, wolf spiders are very similar. So the mom like carries this egg sack with her for two weeks, all the spiderlings hatch out, and then she carries them on her back for like two weeks. And she is basically not eating during this whole time. And, uh, and so we were really interested in like, okay, these are like very similar behaviors. Are there like similar like neural mechanisms mm. that are promoting these behaviors, even though they have like, con, you know, evolved independently, you know, are there similar like themes in the neural structure? Yeah. Um, and so, so that's mostly what our, our, our wolf spider work is about. Um, and so it's, it's, we need a lot of like tool develop. There's not like a spider brain atlas and that's things like at, that. Yeah. yeah. And so it, and I mean, same with frogs though. I think we have to, as we're, we have this goal, this science question, and then we're also having to build a lot of resources as we like make it to that goal. Um, and so we had to like build a, like a spider brain atlas and sequence their genome and like trying to figure out spider neuroanatomy and, and things like that. And so before we can even map on where the neurons in a spider that what's lighting up when they do this, they do parental right. care. Okay. Exactly. So that's ongoing. Yes. Okay. That's that ongoing. answers my question. Yes. Um, you, and you had, you did a lot of work with pair bonding. Yeah. And you had found that uh, when pair bonding is focused on resources, not necessarily parental pair bonding, but resources, that you see more variance in there. You'll see male-male pair bonding, female-female pair bonding, and that is uh, tied to resource protection, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I, I was thinking, well, that's kind of more like community building, right? If like, we're all in this together, mm -hmm. you found that. Yeah. Well, yeah. So. Um, I think the species that, are the, that you're talking about are these butterfly fishes. And what we were interested in is, you know, pair bonding and parental care are intertwined yeah. in mammals. Because when males are involved, they, you know, they typically are, pair, you know, they're at one in a biparental pair bonding species and two, then they are providing parental care. You know, the defin that's one of the reasons I couldn't work on mammals is because you know, the definition of being a mammal is that moms have to be involved. And so it's very difficult to disentangle pair bonding and parental care yeah. in a male mammal. And so I had to not work on mammals to be able to disentangle those two questions. And so, you know, but some species pair bond without parental care. And so these butterfly fishes will just spawn into the water column. But they do like stay paired to defend their, you know, they're, they're coralabarous, so they eat coral, and so they defend these territories. And then, you know, what we found when we started like collecting brains was that, you know, it could be a male male pair, a male female, like th there was like a huge variation in who was pairing up with who. And, you know, someone, to get back to your point, you know, someone even asked me, like, oh, well, is it like really a pair bond or is it just this like intense friendship? And I was like, well, I, I mean, I feel like those are very similar. <laughs> yes, it could be. If, if it makes you more comfortable to care, call it a friendship, that's yeah. fine. Um, but, you know, it's this, like, social bond that persists outside of the context of reproduction. Uh, I read this other thing, too, this other bit of research that you did, and this is in frogs. And um, it was picked up kind of in the media as, like, an empathy thing, and maybe that's how you described it where you would take uh, pair, frogs that have been pair bonded yeah. and you would take one away and stress it in some mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. and measure cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. And then the frogs would be put back together and you would measure the cortisol levels in the other frog that had not been stressed and yeah. their levels were also higher. Yeah. Which suggested that um, they understood what had happened to the other frog mm -hmm. and were having feelings of empathy toward them, kind mm -hmm. of, yeah? Yeah. And I thought, number one, fascinating experiment, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so interesting. But I also thought it was like, well, how did this stress get transferred? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's either some sort of communication where they said, this thing happened to me. Can you believe this happened today? And they said, oh my God, I'm so nervous. Like, or they, yeah. is there some sort of sense or? I, I, yeah, I, so I don't think we know exactly how they're sensing it. So it's definitely, so, you know, and this happens like in humans, this happens in mammals, this happens in birds, where 
you will state match your partner hormonally. So like when your partner like comes home and they're like, oh, I had this really stressful day and they're really stressed, like your cortisol levels will go up too. And you're like, oh, like, and and so there's this hormonal and physiological like state matching. And so, you know, for a long time, they thought like empathy and like state matching um, was something that was unique to us, to primates, to mammals, who I think we understand a lot better than we understand how a frog might be feeling. Yeah. And so, you know, but but Charles Darwin a long time ago thought that actually empathy is very widespread, you know, just like looking at the natural world, like that animals, you know, within a species can can almost understand what's happening to another individual. I mean, it makes sense that they would yeah. be able to read another individual's state to kind of predict what's happening in the environment. And so, but I think, you know, most people didn't now, like don't think that like something like a frog and a fish can, you know, I think empathy is still something that people like to reserve for humans, but they can still like, you know, state match, at least physiologically, their partner who is stressed. And they don't do this to someone who's not their partner was the other part of that study. So we gave them like some, you know, we stressed out their partner and we stressed out this other female. And so, and then the males state match only their partner. And so something about being pair bonded to this individual that they were really stressed, they also like had this cortisol response. And so whether, you know, I don't know, I think whether or not they can like smell the stress or there's some behavior that we don't pick up on as humans that they they can see to it, like with each other, like something is transmitting that this, that this individual is stressed. And I think that's the part we don't understand yet. We just, you know, we, I think we challenge the concept that that something like empathy is only for humans. Yeah, not true, right? Not, not true. true. <laughs> um, but I should be clear, when when they were separated and one was stressed, the other one could not they see that. They couldn't see yeah, it. So, no, yeah. no, no, they there couldn't see it. There had to be some it. communication afterwards. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, so yeah. amazing. Um, okay, I want to ask a few things. One, I was looking at, um, I think just kind of your resume, and the grants that you had gotten. Yeah. So most of your grants are NSF grants, yeah? Uh, we have... Yeah, we have a lot of NSF money, and then um, a lot of um, we have some NIH money. You do okay. Yeah. That that was my question because it seemed like you had gotten something like three point six million in NSF money, and the NSF has something like a ten billion dollar budget, whereas yeah. the NIH has like a forty eight billion dollar budget. Yeah. And so if your work is like I didn't know if it made it, so that that's a smaller pie, the NSF. Yes. But maybe are there less people vying for that pie than no? We, no, it's it's equally as competitive as trying yes. to get NIH money. Yes. Yeah. Some of this work is applicable to humans, as we discussed, at least if you extrapolate it that way. Yeah. But a lot of it is probably not in the eyes of the NIH. Yeah, I think it's something that we we straddle both these worlds, and it's and it's a struggle because um, we do have NIH money, and a lot of it has to do with um, with benefits of the the frog system we're working on. So these tadpoles that we study bond to their mothers they can recognize their moms apart from like stranger frogs and they um, and they communicate when they're hungry yeah and so and we have no we that are like I our knowledge of how like infant brains or like the brains of young are formed and shaped by social experiences and things like that are like very limited and I think because it's very hard to work on those questions in mm-hmm. rodent pups and so where these tadpoles are you know they're transparent and so we can image their brains like throughout development you know because they're not growing up in a womb so we can image brains throughout development and you know a lot of these same genes that we see you know regulating begging behavior and bonding to moms and things like that are the same genes that like mammals have and so you know it's we're, we're studying these bonding processes just in a very in a simpler more accessible system and so that's mostly what NIH has funded us for but it means that when you I mean if you were describing your grant simply as we're gonna figure out what's going on with these frogs oh. without saying how this might you're, you're never gonna get that grant. no 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 yeah in fact because I mean a lot I mean we do get this now you know from NIH is that like I don't you know frogs are a long ways from humans yeah you know like that's the response you get yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. and i mean but that's like my job though as a in like a grantsmanship sense to like convince them that actually it's easier to understand it in this like basic system 
you know, we have to understand the basic principles of this behavior and what's going on in the brain before, you know, we can scale it up to something like more complex and difficult. Um, And so, you know, sometimes panelists are like that and, you know, but other times they're like, you know, we actually learned a lot from flies. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. (laughs) Frogs, you know, are are a little bit closer than that. And so, yeah. And then, you know, but then some, but sometimes they're like, well, you know, you should try for NSF money. Um, because I like mentioned the word evolution or, or something and like that. And the then line. they're like, go <laughs> talk to NSF. And I'm like, no, <laughs> this is relevant. <laughs> um, so along those lines, you have, I think a couple of the L'Oreal, you have a fellowship from L'Oreal, one mm-hmm. of which is for, I think just a grant for research and one is a mentoring yeah. fellowship, right? Yeah. And I'll be dead honest when they, when they first came out with those, I was really skeptical. I thought, this is L'Oreal. They spent their life telling women that their face is important and they need mm-hmm. to look this way. Mm-hmm. And now they're telling me that they're interested in women's brains. I did. I was like, this is a PR stunt through and through. And it probably still is. But, yeah. you know, they've partnered with, what, the American Association for Advancement of Sciences. Science, yeah. They funded Jennifer Doudna, Party yeah. Sibeti. Yeah. They've nurtured some incredible talent. Yeah. And I think that I was a little hasty in my skepticism. Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. I mean, um, yeah, because people have even asked me if they you have to like provide a headshot for that Ugh. grant, and I'm like, no, <laughs> not at all. Um, and so there's actually, you know, as fellows, they have us come to their labs um, to see just how much science is there goes into yeah. that industry, which is the, there's a lot of science happening yeah. there, and a lot of like material science, and a lot of just like really amazing scientists working in that industry. Um, and so, which is something I didn't appreciate before. But the other thing I think that program does is that, you know, they support women at this really critical transition um, between being a postdoc, you know, in this postdoc years. Because this is when, like, most, you know, most people have children. Yeah. And that is really hard. And so they, you know, and there are not a lot of grants that actually support, that, that support, you know, women who are also like community driven and want to like also get give back to the community and and it's also mostly in research funds and so instead of like your salary and so they actually want to like fund your research ideas and so i think they're actually you know filling this really important gap where when a lot of women leave science Mm. and i think actually what they've done has been able to keep more women in science for that reason yeah um, I think I have just one yeah. question left. I mean, we sort of talked about this, but I feel like if you hadn't have hit the evolution class, your life would be totally different. Yeah. Like, is that the thing that completely turned your brain in a new direction? Um, yeah, I think it was a mix of this evolution class and a mix of my animal behavior class. Yeah. Because I think... I didn't know you could have a job or I didn't know there are people who studied those two things. Like what? <laughs> like, cause I, you know, I come from a community where you have to be like very useful and you know, and you have to like, like taking care of animal health is useful from like an agricultural farm aspect or like being a nurse and helping like humans through tough times is a useful aspect. Um, and so studying animals like in their natural context like in and also like how behavior evolves like I didn't know that there were people that did that 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 was a job yeah and I think that opened my eyes to this like possibility that that I could spend my life doing something like that Um, like being outside studying how animal brains worked in the wild I mean when you say it like that it's like a if someone had told you as a child your job is going to be to study animals in the wild, you'd been like, "That's amazing! That's amazing! You're I like, get to do that." I like, yeah. Well, I, I kind of do that now, <laughs> like yeah. as a kid. Well, we're going to like send you around the world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You're I like, had no idea, like you know, the scope of that. That yeah. there were like you know scientists, you know, like working on fro- like that studying frogs would take me all over the planet. That's amazing. Yeah. Given that this is your career now, yeah, has it stressed your relationship with your parents? Like, do they kind of wish that you had stayed on the farm and the grandkids were around all the time? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, my dad told me he was really disappointed in me for a long time. And I think actually only being, the only time he really told me he was proud of me was when I became a faculty member at Stanford. Because he was like, oh, 
I guess what you were doing is what's somewhat important. useful. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it wasn't clear back then, like, like graduate school could be like a waste of time. And I thought, you know, they think it was, it was like pulling me away from our community. And I was, you know, being a bad example to my siblings and, and things like that. So I think like it was definitely this period where they thought I was like run astray. Yeah. Um, but I think it's actually much better now. I think they only like being here have they really realized like have they come to the realization that what we might be doing might be useful to people yeah all the siblings so you have three other siblings yeah are they all out in the world yeah they all live in seattle actually oh, wow. so so yeah and like with you know and and so i think the the level of communication is variable yeah across siblings yeah um yeah it can create a lot of stress um but uh but i think it was really meaningful when my dad like finally like you know he was like disappointed in me for like going to like graduate school and like wasting my life and things like that to like finally when I had this job that he was like I'm really proud of you and I was like and it made me cry (laughs) okay uh I'm gonna stop thank you okay There you go. Great talk with Lauren, I thought. Before I left campus, I managed to go up in the Hoover Tower and to see the Rodin Sculpture Garden, both of which Lauren suggested I do before getting back into an Uber. So thank you for that, Lauren, and thanks for having me into your office. This podcast will be archived on thetransmitter.org and is available wherever you find podcasts. Apple, YouTube, Spotify. Find it and subscribe and you'll get each episode. You can also share the episodes or rate and review Synaptic, which does help other people find the show. Some of the information on Tarrant County College for the intro was taken from the TCC website. Our theme song was written and performed by Chris Collinwood. That's it for episode 11. I'll let the music take us out. Do you have any questions for me before you? Um, do you have any advice or things you don't want me to say? <laughs> no. Um, no.